I hope that song truly prepared us for this morning's message, self-love, selfish, not service. Once again, I give to you the messenger of God's word for this morning, Pastor Noel Espinosa. In my first message of this brief series, I mentioned the song, The Greatest Love of All. Its original singer was George Benson and was first released in 1977, and it occupied the top of the charts for 29 weeks when it was sung a decade later by the late diva Whitney Houston in 1986. It added eight more weeks at the top. Today, there are many more songs with that explicit message of self-love, which it celebrates and are very popular. To mention just two of them, you have the BTS band with its song, Answer, Love Myself. You also have Megan Trainor with her song, I Love Me. Well, this is the present status of the greatest love today. It is celebrated, it is promoted unashamedly. As I've said and observed, even in the past, people were occupied with self-love. This is not a modern phenomenon. But in the past, at least, there was this uh, perception that it is necessary to wrap that self-love with some noble cause. Do not display self-love all by itself, but wrap it with a noble cause of serving others. Well, that wrapping is no longer needed today. Self-love is promoted and celebrated unashamedly, and that is something that we need to address because we too may be giving ourselves to the idea of loving yourself because it is so much affirmed and evangelical counselors even will use the Bible to tell their counselors that they need to love themselves and they make of it something of a command. Now, as I insisted in my first message, self-love is not a sin in and of itself, but it is not a command. Using the familiar language of Jesus when he was challenged by a lawyer, what is the greatest commandment? Jesus said, love God with all your heart, with all your soul, and then love your neighbor as yourself. And as Jesus himself said, these are the two commandments. There are only two commandments that constitute the greatest commandment of all. And therefore, there is no third command here. We are not being commanded to love ourselves. Love of self is not a divine command, but of human nature under God's rule. As I compared it to breathing, you breathe as a matter of nature. Nobody commands you to breathe. And that is the same thing with self-love. We are given a nature that is interested in our preservation, in our happiness. Nothing wrong with that for as long as we see it only as human nature. But because human nature is fallen, uh, self-love by itself is also one that can become sinful. And we saw that last week in Paul's list of sins of the last day in 2 Timothy chapter 3. He echoes the language of Jesus about the greatest commandment as loving God with all your heart and loving your neighbor as yourself. And when Apostle Paul gave us the list of sins of the last day, he bracketed it with the first being lovers of self and the last that of not lovers of God. And there we see how sinful self-love is a door to other sins that culminate in denial of God's claims. But can this happen to believers? Can Christians be guilty of self-love? That will be our last message and conclusion to this series. As I invite you to turn your Bibles with me to Philippians chapter 2. Our concentration is in verses 19 to 22, but we get the background by reading verses 1 to 4. Philippians 2, 1 to 4 and jump to verses 19 to 22. So if there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or concept, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves.
let each, of, let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Now jump to verses 19 to 22. I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you soon, so that I too may be cheered by news of you. For I have no one like him who will be genuinely concerned for your welfare, for they all seek their own interests, not those of Jesus Christ. Verse 22. But you know Timothy's proven worth, how as a son with a father he has served me in the gospel. Now Paul has appealed in the previous passage in chapter 1, verse 27 and following, for unity of the brethren. And there is a graphic language used here by saying you strive side by side. Brethren should be striving side by side, not one going ahead of others or another lagging behind from others, but side by side, you go to the promotion and improvement of one's holiness. And for that to happen, Paul exhorts in chapter 2 that there is a grace necessary in order to maintain the unity of brethren. And what is that grace? That grace is humility. And this grace of humility is described by Paul, one of the best descriptions you find in, in the whole of the scriptures in verse 3 of chapter 2, count others more significant than yourselves. There's humility. Humility is not about self-diffidence. Humility is not lack of confidence. Humility is about treatment of others, giving them the significance that you often give to yourself, give that significance to others. And this is followed beginning verse 5, with the example that is perfect, the example of Jesus Christ in a passage that is well known called the Carmen Christi or the hymn to Christ because it is believed to be a hymn sung in churches even those in those days. But I would love to dwell on that, the example and perfect model of Jesus Christ. But my purpose is to see this humility displayed in believers who are like you and me, believers who struggle with sin. After the perfect model of Christ, Apostle Paul then commends two brothers for their humility. There's Timothy and there's Epaphroditus. But for my message today, and this will be the conclusion of the series, I will settle with Paul's commendation of Timothy because it shows us what happens when self-love reigns in believers, as Paul describes those other than Timothy, while in Timothy, we see self-love overcome by the grace of humility. So the clear contrast is between Timothy as able to exercise genuine concern and therefore serve with humility, while those among the companions of the Apostle Paul, he still sees much of self-interest. I want to draw this message as my conclusion, self-love can become selfish that hinders self-sacrificing service by believers. Ang pag-ibig sa sarili ay maaring maging makasarili na humahad lang sa masakripisyong pamilingkod ng mga mana ng palataya. Self-love can become selfish that hinders self-sacrificing service by believers. Now, the commendation by Paul of Timothy and its implied warning of self-interest are applicable to believers. Paul, after all, is referring to those who are with him in his missionary journey. At this time that he was writing to the Philippians, he was in prison, and there were those who were taking care of him. But Paul wanted to serve someone to Philippi uh, because Epaphroditus was sick or just came from sickness and he wanted someone else to go to Philippi and he could not recommend anyone but Timothy because of an obvious contrast of character. Paul weighs the characters of, the, of those with him and he concludes that the person most fit to be sent is Timothy because his character, as Paul says, is proven that he can exercise genuine concern while the rest still display so much self-interest. Now from this, I, let us learn two facts of, about service in the kingdom of Christ. 
The first is that selfish interest is unbecoming of a servant of Christ. Ang makasariling interest ay hindi nararapat sa isang lingkod ni Kristo. Selfish interest is unbecoming of a servant of Christ. And the second is unselfish service is profitable for the kingdom of Christ. Ang walang pagkamakasariling paglilingkod, ang kapakipakinabang sa kaharian ni Kristo. Unselfish service is profitable for the kingdom of Christ. So let our concluding thought on self-love be on the matter of service. The first thing is that selfish interest is unbecoming of a servant of Christ. In this chapter, Philippians 2, the original servant mentioned is Christ. We see this in his incarnation, and that incarnation is summarized by the words, he became a servant. He could have become human and be royal. He did not choose to do so. Instead, he became human, but human in such a way that his status is that called a servant. That servanthood led Christ to the death of the cross for the purpose of salvation of sinners. And there you see is the reason why the Son of God, the second person of the triune God, came to be human in order that he may die. And he needed to die as a substitute in order to save sinners. If you are looking for salvation somewhere else or in someone else, you will have no real salvation because that salvation is alone in Jesus Christ because he alone is God who became man and died a substitute's death. And there is a display of service to be emulated by the beneficiaries of his salvation through that cross, through that act, which we call in theology, that act of humiliation, Jesus earned his exaltation. He is given a name that is above every name and that they will come and every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus is Lord. Either you do it now and be saved or you will do it on the judgment day and be damned. But here is an example for believers and a warning. Selfishness is a sin that puts self-interest ahead of others, contrary to the servanthood of Christ. Ang pagkamakasarili ay kasalanan na inilalagay ang sariling interes na pangunahin at salungat sa paglilingkod ni Kristo. Now let me just let me just clarify that there is no such thing as we often hear it selflessness of everybody reckons with self we can never be selfless though that is sometimes used like a virtue no there is nothing wrong about thinking of self we do not do away with self and self-love as i maintained in my first message is nature though it is not a mandate it is not sin in and of itself we all are interested in our preservation, interested in our happiness, and nothing wrong with that of itself. But in the case of Christ, his original and pre-existing condition, we are told in this chapter, is he was equal with God. He was in the form of God, and he uses that word that means to say all the characters that make God the God that he is, Jesus was in that form. Jesus has all the attributes of deity, but even then, he did not hold fast to it. Instead, he discounted his own pre-existing condition and volunteered to have a downward movement to become low, as low as a servant. And his service led to death. And not just any kind of death, as we saw in our scripture reading. It was the death of the most humiliating and of the lowliest kind. A death that was not even imposed on Roman citizens, but only on the worst of the worst crucifixion. But that movement that was downward for the Son of God, he earned by it, he earned his lordship to save sinners 
who will believe. Again, I insist that that is your only hope of salvation. Come to Christ, bow down to him as Lord and Savior. But now if you are a believer, you are a beneficiary of salvation blessings deriving from the act of servanthood by Jesus Christ. So how dare then such beneficiary be ruled by a disposition of self-interest as priority? But as Paul here sadly admits that still remains even in believers. In his commendation of Timothy, Paul says of him, he will genuinely be concerned for your welfare. Now, I do not think that Paul means to say that the others in his team, his missionary team, have a fake concern. That's not what Paul is saying. Paul's sad assessment rather is they all seek their own interests, not those of Jesus Christ. It is not fake, but deficient. There is still more of self-interest to move them than the concern of the rule of Christ, the honor of God, and the interest of the brethren, in this case, in Philippi. So exactly this is the opposite of Paul's urging. Remember, let each of you look not only to his own interests, but to the interests of others. Now, let me clarify, the exhortation is not saying that we forget self-interest. That is not what it is saying. What it is saying is not only your self-interest, but let other self-interest intrude so that your self-interest will not become selfish. But self-love has been slowly creeping into the message of the evangelical pulpit today, and there is a promotion perhaps unconsciously of selfishness even among believers. It begins with the decision to be saved with no other reason than that of going to heaven and be spared from hell. Right at the beginning of saying that a person becomes a Christian, there's already selfishness rather than bowing to one who will rule over him. And that is Jesus Christ. Let the act of lowliness of Jesus Christ be the irresistible protest against self-interest as a dominant motive. Vladimir Putin, the dictator of Russia, decided to invade Ukraine, this is the act of megalomania, an illusion of self-greatness. He has given promises. There was the Treaty of Budapest in 1994 even, or 2004, it's 1994, when he promised when Ukraine gave up its nuclear arsenal, remember, Ukraine was part of the Soviet Union and hosted a lot of nuclear weapons. But in that agreement, Russia promised never to attack Ukraine. So it would give up its nuclear weapons. And many more promises to the contrary. He still invaded. This is a man with such great self-interest never mind the lives that it will cost. But every day of our lives, we are confronted with such challenges not to let self-interest rule. And a challenge should therefore overcome selfishness by following the humble servanthood of Jesus. Daigin mo ang pagkamakasarili sa pagsunod sa mababang loob na paglilingkod ni Jesus. Under the major atoning reason of the cross, that's the major reason why Jesus died on the cross, there is a secondary reason, and that is to provide a model. And this is what Paul challenges the Philippians to do. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. And then it goes on to describe how from being in the status of 
the ultimate glory of God, he became a servant. This is the model of one who has a mind that does not look first at self-interest, but to others. And if your life is defined by who Christ is and what he has done for you, it should reverse selfishness or selfish self-interest. It is in Philippians that we find the most straightforward definition of the believer's life in terms of Christ. My own life verse, Philippians 1.21, for to me to live is Christ. In other words, Christ governs, perhaps even intrudes into every issue of self-interest so that Christ may have the governance of our life. We do not need to die, as Paul said, to die is gain, but we do not need to die to prove that we are like Jesus in being unselfish in service. But there is, in our day-to-day, some decisions that need to be done which will choose between self-interest and others. And every fiber of your natural self-love will feel the remaining sin gravitating you to the side of selfishness and against that you must learn to see the shadow of the lowly Christ on the cross from heaven's throne to the cross that's the challenge of servanthood now what could be the regular challenge for you for some it may be as ordinary as Hebrews 10 25 says do not forsake the assembling of ourselves together the worship of the people of God together, even if we do it now by this means, is there self-interest that hinders you from doing that regularly and consistently? And the fact is there are Christians who are hindered from doing it because they are more of self-interest in their motive than of service to Jesus Christ. For others, it may be an act of forgiveness to someone you still will not forgive out of resentment. So what is it to you? This is the reason for Jesus' challenge in Luke 9.23. Take up your cross daily. Many interpret this to mean bearing the cross is suffering. No. Taking the cross is crossing out self-interest for the sake of others. Kiev is the capital of Ukraine, and many do not realize it has a rich Christian history. One of the most respected Christians of the past, one of the leaders who died in 1074 was Theodosius. And even though he was a rich man, he renounced his riches, served the poor, worked with slaves, and left a radiant testimony to the name of Jesus Christ. You are not being asked to renounce whatever blessings the Lord has prospered you with, but you are asked to renounce self-interest as priority in order to serve others. That brings me to my second point. Unselfish service is profitable for the kingdom of Christ. Ang paglilingkod na hindi makasarili ang kapaki-pakinabang sa kaharian ni Kristo. Let us focus here on Timothy. He may in fact be, in terms of personality and temperament, the most likely candidate to be sent by Paul for mission. Even in his very last letter, the second letter to Timothy, Paul is still challenging Timothy to overcome his fear, his diffident disposition and the youthfulness of his age is also a magnet to those who will seek to despise him and so Paul reminds him let no one despise your youth so looks from the external of his youthfulness and the diffidence of his personality he would not be a likely candidate so why did Paul choose him well the one thing that Paul comments of his character is his genuine concern for the welfare of the brethren. In other words, unselfish. So because of the rule of Christ, it is unselfish servants who will be useful for his kingdom. 
Nang dahil sa pamamahala ni Kristo, ang yung mga lingkod na hindi makasarili ang magiging kapakipakinabang sa kaharian ni Kristo. The sending of Timothy follows from the deep Christology of the Apostle Paul, who Christ was in his pre-existing condition, what he became in his incarnation, what he earned by his exaltation. And all this now leads to who should be sent, who will be profitable for the rule of Christ in service. And he singles out Timothy among several in his team because Timothy, though diffident, who probably would take the back seat to others, yet as Paul looked at his companions, it's Timothy who stood out as far as unselfishness is concerned. That character of being unselfish is, as Paul defined it earlier, it is to treat others as more significant. Now, the old translation has led to some confusion because the older translation is treat others better than yourself. And it sometimes gives the idea, should that mean I consider someone else's gift obviously mediocre better than someone's strained gifts? Well, that is not the point. And it is rightly translated here, not as better in terms of gifts or ability, but rather in terms of significance. You see, no one can be better than Jesus. And yet, he treated others as significant in terms of service. So it pertains to the object of service, and that will require humility. The kind that Jesus demonstrates in not holding fast to his status as son of God. Now, even Christians can be so status conscious. And they get offended when that status is discounted. But count yourself a servant now of Jesus Christ. He is now the ruling king. He has been exalted, and even though only believers recognize that, for the most part, the world does not recognize that. And I'm calling upon you to recognize that and bow before the Lordship of Jesus Christ. But for those of you and me who have, recent, who have seen Jesus Christ as risen Lord, then that's the challenge to a selfish self-love. It's like a doctor performing a surgery. He is forced for the duration of the surgery to be unselfish. He would not think about what place he is going to enjoy, what movie he is skipping because of the surgery. He's just thinking of what good will be for his patient. Well, you and I are in that act of service where we need, we are compelled by the rule of Christ to be unselfish and to think of others. So I challenge you, pursue service with an eye to the present and future lordship of Jesus Christ. Maglingkod ka na nakatingin sa kasalukuyan at sa hinaharap na pag Kapanginoon, ni Jesus Christo, from the lowliest of servanthood and death, Jesus Christ earned the status of lordship. We are not talking here of his being lord because he is God. That's his essential lordship. We are talking here of his mediatorial lordship. That is, that lordship he earned by dying and rising from the dead. He is now the king expected by the Israelites, yet when he came, they rejected him. He is now sitting on his throne. He is ruling, and only believers acknowledge that rule. And for that very reason that he rules, we should define our service in terms of serving the Lord Jesus Christ. And yet many times, even as we wrap what we do in the guise of service, 
there can still be so much of selfish self-love. This is what we need to put under the Lordship of Jesus Christ. You see, selfishness will not survive under the shadow of the cross of Christ. So imagine if Paul were looking for someone to send today. He's looking at our church. He's looking at Christians, including you. Will you be singled out as he singled out Timothy, who will genuinely care for the welfare of the brethren? Or will you be one of the many of whom Paul says they all seek their own interests? not those of Jesus Christ. Again, in this series, I have maintained that self-love in and of itself is not sin. It is nature. It is not Monday. We possess it, but we do not need to be consciously doing it. And self-love can be sinful and not a virtue. And for Christians, this is the warning. Self-love can be selfish that will hinder your life of service. <clears throat> Remember that you are under the rule of Christ and it is the humble, it is the lowly like Christ who will serve profitably in his kingdom. In John Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress, one of the less known characters is Mr. Great Heart. And one achievement of Mr. Greatheart is a servant of the better known character, the interpreter. But Mr. Greatheart is a servant of the interpreter and Mr. Greatheart kills four giants. The most well-known to us is giant despair. They represent those things that harass believers. And by that, Banyan is saying, it is the great heart, one who is willing to be a servant to others, who will in fact be giant slayers. The giants that harass the Christian are slain by those who are humble of heart. Those who like what Paul says, treat others as more significant than themselves. So there will be some forms of service that will still serve selfish self-love. Christian service must mortify it by the shadow of the cross and learn that, like, that kind of service that will truly serve for the welfare of others, for the honor of Christ, and not for self-interest. That is the thought of our response him. Go labor on, and the second verse is one that I like very much. Go labor on, tis not for naught. Thy earthly loss is heavenly gain. Men heed thee, love thee, praise thee not. The master praises. What are men? To serve the master, not self. Let us sing. Go labor on. Let's close in prayer. Our great God and gracious Heavenly Father, may we cast our eyes upon the Lord Jesus, who was in his pre-existing condition, equal with God in the form of God, and yet did not hold fast to that position, but discounted himself and became human, not just human in a high status, but he chose to be a servant. And that is now presented to us as our model, as Paul urges to have this mind in us as it was in the Lord Jesus. So grant, Lord, that this commendation by Paul of Timothy may be an encouragement to us, a model of what it is to follow the Lord Jesus in our servanthood. We confess that we still are many times motivated by a prior self-interest and a selfish self-love. And we ask, Lord, that we may learn to put self-love in its proper place. It is not wrong in and of itself. We still have, and we can escape reckoning with ourselves, but may we learn to put it uh, in subjection to what should be prior to our lives, the honor of Jesus Christ who now rules. 
We pray for those who still have to submit to that rule that this day may be the day when they will cast themselves upon Christ for their salvation, for that is the only way of salvation. And for those of us who have received this salvation blessing, may our service be characterized by unselfishness and may we cast our selfish thoughts, self-love and self-interest under the shadow of your cross and there mortify such selfishness and learn to be genuinely concerned for others and treat others as more significant than ourselves as Jesus did. And we pray that all this will redound to your praise and to your honor. And now may the love of God the Father, the grace of his Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. In Jesus' name we pray these things. Amen.